What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the headquarters. Welcome back to the channel. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football. Times New Roman fit because today we're coming proper. We are finishing off our official do not draft list. The full list is in the draft guide, which went live yesterday. Let's go, people. Go support the brand. Go support your boy if you freak with my work. Promise you will not be disappointed by the draft guide. If you already copped it, let me know what you think down below. Let me know what kind of additions you would like to see in the draft guide. Because as you all know, we update it throughout the entirety of the summer. This thing is fluid. It's on mobile, desktop, laptop, tablet. is everywhere, man. We're talking about wide receivers that you should be shying away from at their current ADP average draft position I wish there was another term for average draft position like I'm so sick of saying ADP can we just say like normalize saying where these motherfuckers getting drafted WT MF GD WT MF GD you're avoiding these wide receivers based on WT MF GBD fuck I fucked that up whatever y'all know what I'm talking about it's time to tuck our shirts in god I'm having trouble today stop yelling let's eat Let's go. Real quick, the deal on Monkey Knife Fight is available only to first time depositors, and you must be in a state that's eligible to play Monkey Knife Fight. If not, you could just cop it from Big Dogs Draft Guide. Dot com and you must play a game on monkey knife fight once you deposit so you deposit 10 use two dollars of the ten dollars then you will get access to the guide via an email from me let's talk about mike evans and why we are not drafting him this year he is currently going off the board at the 211 the 211 so we're talking about using our second round pick on michael evans my problem with evans is the things that he has relied upon the things that he relied upon in 2019 to have such a good year are things that i think might not be as plentifully plentifully available to him in 2020. What I'm referring to is the pass volume, particularly downfield. And this is coming from someone who doesn't even think Tom Brady is shot or that his deep ball will be fine going into 2020. The Bucks started basically every game in comeback mode last year. Jameis Winston came out the gate and was like, y'all, let's do the coin flip, but also let's not do the coin flip because if we get the ball, I'm going to throw it to y'all. And if you guys get the ball, how about you don't throw it to us because that's how you play football. So more often than not, we're starting with the Jameis pick six Palooza in these Bucks games. They're down right away. They're throwing the ball at a rate as high as any team in the NFL. So when you're looking at this Bucks passing offense, like who is more likely to repeat the numbers that they had? For me, it's it's Chris Godwin because Mike Evans saw 8% more of his targets downfield compared to Godwin. Mike Evans had 1.92 deep targets per game last year, which was tied for fifth. Count them, read them and weep. One, two, three, four, five. Among all NFL wide receivers, Jameis Winston unsurprisingly led the NFL with 99 deep attempts. You can have just thrown one more in there, Jameis. 15.8% of his throws were downfield. On the other hand, you have Tom Brady, 62 deep balls compared to Jameis Winston's 99. Only 10.1% of his throws went downfield. The drop-off in QB tendencies is going to be massive for Mike Evans. You look at the Tampa team, they're going to be way less of a roller coaster ride than they were last year. Now they got the goat under center. They're not going to be in 30-point deficits and throwing 30 deep attempts a game, a lot of them going to Evans. This is a team with a 9.5 win total per Vegas with pretty heavy juice, minus 130 on the over, on them hitting 10 wins. I want to read off some stats from Sharp Football. Last year, Tampa was trailing in games on 530 of their offensive plays they threw the ball on 70 percent of those trailing plays which was the fifth highest rate on trailing plays in the entire league they were winning on 401 snaps so losing on 535 throwing at a 70 percent rate losing games on 401 of their offensive snaps but now they threw the ball on 52 percent of their plays 15th highest rate in the league obviously the percentage the rate is going to come down when you're trailing you're way more likely to throw the ball however the rate is what we're looking at relative to other teams when they were trailing or when they were leading you see that rate come down from 70 percent fifth highest to 15th highest so it tells you that bruce arians wants to be a much more balanced offense he does not want to operate the way that they did in 2020 i think that's fucking obvious obviously no team wants to operate the way they did with Jameis at quarterback that's why he came out and said if we could do it with Jameis, we could do it with anyone Jameis put them in a hole more 
more often than not. And that led to such epic fantasy production from these wide receivers. So I mentioned why I'm, I'm nervous about Evans and the downfield production, but I'm also I'm also like I'd be lying if I said I wasn't concerned about Gronk coming back too. I know he's looking super skinny and who knows what real impact he's going to have. He might only play on 40 or 50 percent of the snaps, but I'll tell you what, the snaps that he does play on are going to be situational at worst and they're going to be in the red zone and they're going to be where Brady dominates and they're going to be where Brady and Gronk have dominated together for a long, long time. So if he is a specialist, it's going to come in the end zone. It's going to come near the pay dirt and it's going to come at the expense of probably Mike Evans touchdowns because you look at the trio of tight ends they have there now Gronk Cameron Brate's been a red zone threat they have OJ Howard who hasn't broken out yet and probably never will but at worst I mean that's not a bad fucking tight end two or three to have on your team so I'm a little bit nervous about these tight ends taking end zone work where Mike Evans makes some of his money Mike Evans is worth a second round pick in fantasy when his premium assets are at a premium and you know they're going to be there and that is deep targets and that is end zone looks and they were there in 2019 but I'm I'm very very significantly worried about both of those this year a more balanced offense, a less aggressive downfield thrower in Tom Brady, and Gronk coming onto the team. It, it's looking bleak for Evans. I'm not arguing that Evans is a bad fantasy player, that he's going to fall off or anything, but I, I think you're going to get a lot more like five for 70 games throughout the year. You know, more often than not, maybe like seven touchdowns, possibly. And for a second round pick, you know, that's not going to end up being terrible end of year production. But for a second round pick, when other guys are getting potential league winners, that is going to kill your production. That is going to halt any chance you have at having a league winning team. So for that reason, I will be staying away from Michael Evans. Just like last video, if you missed, I, I did a running back version of this video on Tuesday, a couple days ago. It was a good vid. So go check that out. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe after you check that video out. Let me know down below who y'all are fading right now at cost at at all costs, either of the two, I don't care. Drop a comment down below, and while you're down there, hit the button that looks a little song, something like that. I think me and Snacks are going to get a tattoo next week. I put them in charge. This, you know, it's funny. Like the people on on the Big Dogs team, I put them in charge of different things, and most of them are like work related. I'll be like, Animal, I need you to think of the next two TikToks we're going to do and write out a script for them. I'll be like, No, I need you to edit the video for this. You know, Scott, I need you to chop up a Twitter clip for this. For Snacks, it's like, <laughs> he does a newsletter. He does a good job on it. But for Snacks, I'm like, Snacks, you got you got a job. He actually came to me. He wanted to get a tattoo. Something about the fucking Giants, of course. He doesn't have any, which is awesome that I'm, I'm pumped that we're going to go get his first one together. But I was like, yeah, just I want you to figure out what tattoo shops. We're still like kind of closed down here in Manhattan. Most places are, I guess. And all you fucking idiots that are in states that open back up are not closing down again. I'm sorry. I'm, I don't mean to laugh at it. That sucks. But um shouldn't have fucking opened early wear your mask people please anyways um i put snacks in charge of finding a tattoo shop in our area that's good that's quality enough quality for him i don't really give a fuck who died. I, could, I could have someone walking right now with a tattoo gun that's never done it before and fucking tattoo me as big facts and make sure they're open and get us a couple appointments so that will be in the next fade the public we're doing a lot more like vlog style of stuff tomorrow's fade the public video is fucking awesome i'm really excited to get it out to you guys we did a, an mtv crib spoof that opening scene that i put in here with the bike when i fucking skirted in that's from that let's go so fade the public is going to be dope tomorrow and we're going to be doing a lot more like lifestyle footage within fade the public and that tattoo will definitely be in there so stay tuned for next week or maybe next 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 week let's talk about the second wide receiver this is going to be this is going to be a bold take i'm going to get a lot of backlash for this and i'm, I'm actually i'm pretty excited i like getting fucking backlash this next wide receiver resides in the rainy coffee state i know it's not a fucking state so don't comment it of Seattle. DK Metcalf. Let's hear it. Let's hear the boos. Let's hear the jeers. Currently going off the board as the wide receiver 18, a fourth round pick. And I'm well aware that this is going to be one of the bolder players that I list throughout the summer to fade. And to be honest, I might even take a share of him in a redraft just because the hype is so high. I'm like, fuck, I might miss out on this train. And listen, I always diversify the revenue. I tell you guys that if I'm drafting five teams, I get players that I don't like on some of the teams and I fade players that I do like on other teams because I'm going to be wrong on a lot of shit. And so are you. So make sure you diversify the 11 you, DK Metcalf, will be one of the players that I that I don't want any part of, but I might take one share of. My, my problem with DK Metcalf is that like we've we've gone through this offseason so far so dynasty focused, and we're getting excited about it. DK, DK, I could buy into DK Metcalf and dynasty for sure, but his value of 
redraft ADP and dynasty ADP is basically fucking intertwining. And that needs not to be the case yet. Maybe a year from now, I could understand that. But right now, his dynasty value is still much, much higher than his redraft value is. He's like the wide receiver 16 or 17 in dynasty and wide receiver 18 in season long. Metcalf far exceeded my expectations in his rookie year. But Tyler Lockett is, is very much still here. And he is still the apple of Russell Wilson's eye. The chemistry between Wilson and Lockett is, is basically unrivaled. Seattle has never seen anything like it outside of Earl Thomas and his big brother. It, had it not been for that weirdo midseason injury for Lockett last year, like this dude was on pace for real, real wide receiver one solidified numbers. He ended up finishing as a wide receiver 14, but a lot of those games in midseason, he had that weird injury, then they had the bye week, so he didn't end up missing time, but he played as a decoy for a bunch of weeks, and then his production started fluctuating like crazy. So maybe this entire thing is, is less of a point about Metcalf being at the wide receiver 18, but the fact that Lockett is going as a wide receiver 22 in redraft, I think is a, a crazy, crazy dichotomy there. I understand the physical attributes of Metcalf get us very excited, but people are acting like Metcalf finished as a wide receiver two last year. He did not even finish as a wide, uh, wide receiver, a high end wide receiver three last year. If you go by points per game, I hate to be the one to break this to you, but of all the wide receivers who played at least 10 games last year, Metcalf finishes the wide receiver 41 in points per game. And now he's being drafted as a mid wide receiver too. Like I get like Metcalf, but even if he does take a step forward statistically from where he was last year, that wide receiver 41, he can do so and still not return value on where you're drafting him. That's my argument here is I don't see the ceiling for DK Metcalf in season long this year because Lockett is still there. And even if Metcalf jumps him as the number one receiver there in terms of targets, which I don't think is going to happen, I still see it being extremely close where Metcalf gets, you know, 110 targets and Lockett's around the 100 mark. And it's going to be, you know, 1,000 yards, 1,100 receiving yards to 1,000 receiving yards for the other ones. But I don't think the ceiling of Metcalf is so much higher than Lockett's that he should be going ahead of him because they already have the built-in chemistry with Lockett for years of playing with Russell Wilson. And you, and you look at the offense overall, like this is very much still a run first offense. They ran the ball in 54% of their plays last year, sixth highest rate in the NFL a year after being the number one highest rated run team in the NFL in 2018. Like when I'm looking at ADPs, Metcalf is one spot behind Adam Thielen. And I, you know, you've, you've heard me talk about Adam Thielen already this summer. Adam Thielen has a legitimate, you know, 140 to 150 target upside in that offense without digs there. So you're going to choose between those two. Give me Thielen 10 days out of the week. Right behind Metcalf is Robert Woods. You're going to tell me you'd rather have Metcalf this year in season long than Robert Woods. You're out of your fucking mind. Woods, who's getting picked behind Metcalf per high stakes ADP, has done the last two years what we are praying Metcalf would do this year in season long. So you could take the guy who we've seen do it for two years and is set up to do it again this year, or the guy who you're hoping to take that next step forward, surpass Tyler Lockett in a run first offense, just to put up the stats that Robert Woods will put up. You look at DK Metcalf's former college teammate, AJ Brown, who is in a very similar situation. He's on a run first offense. You don't know what the volume is going to be like, except we know AJ Brown is the clear alpha there. With Metcalf's situation with Lockett, it's almost like looking at AJ Brown in a redraft position if Stefan Diggs was on his team. If Stefan Diggs was opposite AJ Brown, you'd be scared to fucking take AJ Brown in redraft because you don't know who's going to get, you don't know what the volume type is going to be there. You already don't know what it's going to be in a run first offense in Tennessee. Same thing with the Seattle. So the fact that we don't know he's the wide receiver one there should give you hesitation i also think metcalf benefited greatly like he started getting so many end zone looks down the stretch of the year like his end zone numbers and the targets that he got down there were crazy but that was only after all of these seattle tight ends started getting hurt russell wilson loves using tight ends in the red zone near the end zone they went out and they signed greg olson i don't think he's great they have jacob hollister will disley hopefully is back from injury they drafted uh colby parkinson the rookie who i think might have got hurt already to be honest but they made sure that they have someone usable at tight end at all times on the field and i think that hurts dk metcalf's numbers a little bit if you actually look at the splits between when the tight ends were on the field and when a starting tight end was not on the field that's when the numbers jumped up for metcalf near the end zone i think overall like the most likely outcome is that we see tyler lockett finish in the wide receiver 15 to wide receiver 20 range that he finished last year you know, and probably take maybe a little bit of a step back if you want to be generous with it. And I think we see Metcalf maybe jump up to that back end wide receiver two area. I think that's a reasonable jump up to expect. Give me someone with more statistical, not physical upside at this point in the draft. So in the fourth round, I'm not taking someone at wide receiver two price that I hope hits back end wide receiver two ceiling. Robert Woods has wide receiver one ceiling for sure in his range of outcomes. Adam Thielen has wide receiver one ceiling for sure in his range of outcomes. There are just other guys that I would much, much rather take 
at the end of the fourth round than DK Metcalf. I also just want to throw this bike out there. Like, it's unfair to hold this against them. I just think it's worth noting for everybody in case they forgot. Like, Metcalf came into the NFL with a very, very concerning injury history in college, right? He could not play a full season to save his fucking life. Then he comes into the summer and he has a few issues. I think he had like a abdomen surgery. He had a knee and oblique strain or whatever in the summer. So this guy is not completely like injury proof either. He did play the full 16. So I don't want to hold it against him. He showed that he could hold up throughout the course of the NFL season. But I also think that is something to take into note because his college history with injuries was actually significant. I know the name Metcalf is polarizing to label as a player that you should not be drafting, but I hope I I biked it up with the big facts. If you have been enjoying the big facts in this video, make sure again you hit that button that looks like that. If you're new to the channel, we're spitting fantasy shits literally five days a week. So make sure y'all subscribe. Again, drop down below in the comments who y'all are fading. What you think about that DK Metcalf spit? I know I'm gonna get a lot of backlash on that. I'm excited for it. I'm here for it. Let's talk about some other wide receivers. We talk about Stefan Diggs. I'm gonna put Stefan Diggs on this list as well going as the wide receiver 25 you could definitely do worse than Diggs as the wide receiver three but he's only technically priced there right wide receiver 25 you're really gonna have to get him probably as like a back-end wide receiver too and his name value alone is probably what's going to keep him being drafted inside the top 25 moving teams is is bad for a wide receiver that first year move well not always but we talked about it with deandre hopkins a couple videos back in the wide receiver rankings that first year moving to a new team is, is always statistically a drop off for the wide receiver it might be a great play in the nfl like real life player making the team better but statistically it usually doesn't ramp back up until the second year and this is going to be even more so without having an actual off season to kind of work together and get that timing and chemistry with the new quarterback it's only a matter of time before Josh Allen throws past Stefan Diggs for the fourth time in a game he starts going nuts and then Stefan Diggs starts missing Captain Kirk over the last two years I'm looking at some numbers Kirk's deep ball completion percentage has been around 12 to 15 percent higher than Josh Allen's has that's just unfortunate for the fucking uber talented Stefan Diggs he's just so good at football we want to see Stefan Diggs be the alpha which he will be in Buffalo but this is again a run first team who is not going to be looking to game plan around Stefan Diggs. We want to see him hit a ceiling. He just won't do that in Buffalo, at least not in year one. And the last one I want to put on this list is uh, AJ Green. Going off as the wide receiver 28. Are you all fucking seriously doing this again? Are we doing this again? It's 2020. Actually, that's kind of fitting. Some more bullshit like this. Do not draft AJ Green as the wide receiver 28. If y'all wanna see where I have him ranked, you're gonna have to cop the draft guide and then you're gonna have to go to the rankings and scroll until you got carpal tunnel. I'm not even gonna talk about why. Honestly, watch any video from 2019 and I probably talk shit about AJ Green and why you shouldn't have been drafting him since like fucking February. And that's because of the injuries that he had all off season, people were downplaying them, but we have Dr. Morse. And he told us why we should have been fading AJ Green, bro. And he's got his entire injury guide within the big dogs guide. Again, the draft guide is live. And that includes the entire official list of our do not draft players spiked by the best big facts in the industry. Quarterbacks, tight ends, wide receivers, running backs, got our sleepers, our best undervalued players, all of our rankings, every league scoring type. It's got Dr. Morse's injury guide. It's got a ton of exclusive articles that y'all are going to love in there to help you become a better fantasy player. It doesn't just give you the players that we like it. You know, you teach a man how to make a mark and he'll stay buzzed forever. You know what I'm saying? We're trying to build a community of people that get better at fantasy, not just listen to me and then forget everything I'm saying. The draft guide will ensure that you become a better player. We talk a lot of strategy, a lot of process, obviously a lot of player analysis, but that is not the main focus of the guide. So again, y'all can hop over to monkeyknifefight.com because they are sponsoring it. They're the best in the business when it comes to player games, things like that. During the season, we will rip off a lot of monkey knife fight games to help y'all bring in in the revenue monkeyknifefight.com when you deposit ten dollars and use the promo code bdge and then go play a game on their website you'll get the draft guide for free you'll get dr morse's draft guide for free you'll get our rookie dynasty guide also for free all on the same website literally just throw down ten dollars monkeyknifefight.com use promo code bdge play a two dollar game and you will get an email the following day with access to the guide. I love y'all. That's all I got for Thursday. Happy July 4th weekend, man. I really got nothing but love for you guys as I reflect upon another release of the draft guide. You know, this is, this is a big day for me. Or yesterday was a big day for me. I'm filming this on Wednesday, so today is a big day for me. It's a product launch day, man. This is like, those those are very few and far between in the business world, at least for the way I run my business. It's, it's my one big product a year. 
And I get really fucking nervous when I put it out, to be honest, because I just want to make sure it's, it's good enough for you guys, you know, that I've improved upon last year, that I've improved as a person when I'm putting the work and the effort behind this product, man. So I just want to be the best it can be. So any feedback or comments or updates that you would like to see to the guide, I'm completely open for it. Shoot me an email, drop me a comment, fucking tweet at me, whatever you want to do, man. I'm here for y'all. I do this for you. Hit that thumbs up if you want to support me. I love y'all. I'll see you tomorrow.